In the Enma Talks Presents sessions, we give the floor to teaching staff, students and alumni from the Enma community. In this line of sessions, they are invited to present their ongoing projects with the aim of inspiring colleagues and peers across the institutions. In this session, we're happy to welcome Torben Bistergaard. Welcome to the session, Lifting the Curtain to Pedagogical Theory in Practice, can instructional videos facilitate an opening into the otherwise private teaching room? So welcome to uh, the session. Today's title is Lifting the Curtain to Pedagogical Theory in Practice. Can instructional videos facilitate an opening into the otherwise private teaching room? And uh, as I said, today's presenter is Torben Vestergaard. Torben is a lecturer at the Royal Academy of Music in Aarhus, Aalborg in Denmark. And he will be doing a presentation based on his research project Between Bird and Frog Videocasts as a Learning Medium for Music Teachers and share insights about how instructional, instructional videos might play a role in translating pedagogical theories into practice. And in this, we also talk about how to lift the curtain and build community around sharing pedagogical practice between teaching staff because the teaching room can be a very private place. And we asked the questions, might videocasts be a first step in breaching the barriers of the teaching room? So with that said, welcome to you, Torben. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank um, you. I will put you on screen now instead of me. There you go. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hi and welcome everyone. I'm very happy to be here to be able to share some of the uh, insights that I may have found. Or and um, as Camila put it, that whether it, instructional video will be <clears throat> the first step into sort of lifting the curtain to the teaching room. That <clears throat> that sorry. <clears throat> That is debatable, but it could it could be one step into it, and I'm I'm very curious to to hear your thoughts about it at the end, because uh, I don't consider my project as sort of a uh, like an all finished thing. It's a, a should be a project in uh, progress, and it should be a, a a project that should be developed through time, and not only by me, but hopefully by others as well and and if it was in a collaboration that would be absolutely wonderful so i'm very curious to hear can i just ask very sh short uh brief where where are you guys located are we all in the same country I, it looks like not so where are you guys from i'm just i'm curious. i'm the employed smi is stockholm's music pedagogiske institute so we're in stockholm sweden fantastic yeah, I'm uh, Michael Stobelt. I um, work in Tromsø at the university, but I'm currently with my students on a study tour in Budapest. So I'm at a hotel. <laughs> Wonder, the wonders of the internet. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sitting in Gothenburg. I'm working at the Academy of Music and Drama at the acting department. Ah, fantastic. So well, uh, this, is, this is the Sibelius Academy in Helsinki. Fantastic. So... And Great. this is RMC, Copenhagen. I'm oh, sorry, I, I couldn't see everyone. Um, let me do. Melina, hey, Melina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, now I can see everyone. And Christian, hey. Uh, Hi. Yeah. And uh, Michael, where are you at? I'm at uh, in, in, in Tromsø, in northern Norway. Oh, okay, fantastic. Yeah, and as I said, right. right now, in Budapest, in the, yeah. in the study tour, the Kodai Institute. <laughs> fantastic. Mm. All right. Uh, so if it's OK, I would like to share my screen with you. Yep. Um, and Camilla, you're welcome to say if uh, if time is sort of running out or at some point. I will. I will make the soundtrack from what is what's it called? Uh, Jaws, if you get close to the time limit. Oh. Well, that's, <laughs> that's almost tempting to do it then. All right, can everybody see the screen? Yes, but it's not in presentation mode yet. It's not? Nope. Um, but we do see it. What? Oh, sorry. The... Uh, 
Let me try again. I don't know what happened. We just we just tried it before you guys got here. This is the curse of the good general rehearsal. When it, that goes well, well, you know you're going to be in trouble in the real thing. Yeah, now it's perfect. Now it's perfect. All right. All right. So the, the name of my project um, is, in a certain sense, you could say it's instructional video as a learning medium for music teachers. And the thing is, when you do these kind of research projects at the conservatory, they like it to have sort of a catchy title. So uh, the the leader of the program asked me to come up with something else. And what I came up with is uh, what's there between bird and frog and whether the analogy uh, is stable. I'm, I'm not completely convinced, but uh, at least it's amusing because the thing is, with a frog, the the frog has a very limited eyesight, so it can only see, like, can you see my hands as well? Okay, so I can make gestures and stuff. That's great. So the the, fro the frog only can see for a limited amount, and some people say it can only see as far as its tongue, because it's interested in catching flies and stuff. And that could be uh, one picture, one way to sort of portray the teaching when I'm in a teaching situation or we, when we are in a teaching situation, we are very involved with here and now and what's going on in that side of the room and that side of the room and relating it to the topic and everything. So we sort of get very involved in the situation. Whereas on top, the bird has a more sort of overview uh, kind of approach and it looks for things and it sees patterns and it sort of moves to where where it think it would be the next great place to be if you are a bird and then it gets into action and that's where the analogy a little bit falls apart but the what i was trying to sort of portray is uh the two different er uh, two different sort of positions that you can have in a teaching situation you can be very involved in the practical matter and you can also sort of have a broader view on the situation and try to find out which a uh, way would be the most beneficial to behave in a certain situation and that's where i think we as mu uh, musician teaching musicians teaching music we tend to be very involved in our in here and now and we are really great at doing that and this project is sort of about introducing another way or another dimension that could be added to what we already do uh, if I'm saying something that's completely unclear, you, it's possible to say so. And otherwise, I'll just sort of keep going and we can take some questions at the end. I hope that's okay with everyone. All right. So, <clears throat> sorry. The thing is um, sort of like the, uh, the background for this project as well is I've looked into some research about teaching and the teaching position and the way to go about teaching. And this this uh, uh, German <clears throat> psychologist called Schulman, who has described, which I found to be very uh, applicable to our situation, the thing he has called signature pedagogies. And what he means by that is that what we do, the kind of thing that we do is so involved, uh, is so um, sort of woven together in ways of thinking, ways of performing, and ways of acting. And somehow we get these things to balance in the situation. So, so when we teach somebody about music, most of the times we teach them like how it works for in our world, the way we see it, the way we do it, the way we sort of think about it and feel about it and act when we do these kind of things. So we we are it's very sort of interwoven in that sense that it's um, becomes very personal and it becomes sort of like my signature way of teaching and I'm I'm sure I'm pretty sure that that, that you can see that kind of situation for yourself especially when teaching a practical field or a craft like music and uh, Schulman he has some different categories. He has a lot of categories, but there are three of them that I, that I have sort of um, taken out to use for this project. And uh, because he says 
he doesn't speak about music. He, spe he speaks about general pedagogy. But I, but I sort of, um, I and others have uh, sort of made this applicable for music as well. So it also, it has to do with understanding music and it has to do about the, the last one, understanding mu music learning. So like say when you're in a, in a situation, I'm teaching, I'm a bass player, as you can see on my hands, <laughs> they go through here. So if I'm teaching somebody to play the bass, I know music myself. I have personal experience with music. So that's sort of the base of everything. But then I also know something about how do I teach somebody to play music? So I uh, I bring in uh, songs or scores or whatever, or topics that I think that I think is relevant for the person. <clears throat> so this big, big thing called playing music, I'm able to sort of take out parts and uh, make them understandable for persons. And this, this might, I'm sure this is pretty obvious for all of you, but that's what we do. But what we do less is the middle one, the one the, uh, that he calls general pedagogical knowledge. And it has to do about uh, the knowledge that you have about teaching, but not about music teaching, but, but, but about teaching in general. So that could be another way to put that could be the ability to to be able to cheat somebody something so it's a general capacity and it's uh, i think that's where we as music teachers has um, at least my experience are less experienced with this particular kind of knowledge and why would i go about doing a project like this with another part of the background is that in Denmark, when you teach in a music school, what has happened a lot within the last uh, three, four, five years maybe, is that more and more the music teachers has to collaborate with school teachers um, doing musical projects in the school time or in SFO, which is like, uh, what would that be? Uh, the place you go after school until your parents come and pick you up. It's um, uh, it would be in Danish. I hope that helps somebody. But you, 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 I think you know what I'm speaking about. So these music teachers that comes from tradi traditional music schools, they all of a sudden have to collaborate with these teachers in the public education, which has a much more thorough and detailed education within general pedagogic. And that's... Um, that situation needs that they need to speak together these two groups and what they need to speak is sort of a common language that's shared by both sides about the act of teaching and that's a that's a, a big challenge in the danish music education um, practice right now to sort of find out how can we get this common language for teaching up and running and how can we do it in a way where it's not uh, the music teachers that are supposed to become somebody completely else, but it's sort of where, how can we meet in the middle with this shared language? But I'm, I'm gonna get back to that um, on some of the next slides. Speaking about, here comes the next slide. Because one of the things when I, when I teach uh, either present music teachers or upcoming music teachers, it's very, uh, it's a big emphasis for me to stress that they are not, I'm not trying to make them someone else than they are already. I'm trying to sort of make their world bigger somehow. And uh, this is a picture that I took during my summer holiday. And it's sort of in the middle where the two sort of streams, they meet. This is a very interesting place to be as far as learning new things. So if you, on the left side, you have the teachers and the normal way of going about it. And on the right side, you have general pedagogical, uh, pedagogic theory. What happens in between in sort of where they meet? That's where I'm, that's where I'm interested in, um, in working with these instructional videos. And as you can see right in the middle, my hope is that uh, these instructional videos can function as what you what you call a boundary crossing object, and what it, what that is is, it's 
a thing, uh, artifact, as a, like a real tangible, touchable thing that, at least in this case, that somehow seen from the side of the music teachers is believable, it's recognizable, and they understand, okay, this is something that has to do with me. But also on the other side, coming from like more general pedagogical theory, if somebody from there sees the video, they will also recognize enough to make it meaningful for them. So this boundary crossing object is like a stepping stone between two uh, otherwise separated um, sort of fields. I hope it's understandable, but if not, you can ask me afterwards. So um, that's where this, Camille, I think maybe these slides will be available somehow or? Yeah, we can definitely do that. Yeah, or, no or even you could, if it's on YouTube, you can pause the video because this basically speaks about the same thing, that the thing that I, it's, uh, the purpose is not to make somebody somebody to make them into something else, but it's to make them like a, a bigger version of themselves and give them more opportunities. And uh, on a practical level, just as far as being a more efficient, good teacher, but also as far as a um, sort of uh, job employment, that you actually have some of the competencies that uh, are, are sought after in the in when they um, the music school sort of needs to to employ new people. Sorry, I have to uh, speak English, but so do you. So anyway. Uh, so what is it why is it that music uh, these instructional videos and i intentionally further on in the project went to the first it was vidcast then it was video cast and then i i found out actually the the most exact term is instructional video for what we do so what is is it that um why could that be a boundary crossing object that could be a good question so here comes hopefully some good answers one of the there's a lot of uh, sort of research around instructional videos and one of the things that they you know from research is that it's very it's a great vehicle for self-directed learning because you can watch, watch them in your spare time in your free time you can watch them uh, a number of times you can pause them and all these kind of things you can do by yourself uh, makes video a, a, a great communication tool in in this sense. It's also great for um, research shows. That is also great for when you sort of want to show somebody how you perform a, a procedure within professional behavior. And uh, the third one is it's good because you have the the sort of the uh, visual side along with it and you you it's able sorry you're able to demonstrate things so it's very good to sort of uh, illustrate more complex real situations that could be a teaching situation the instructional videos that, that i have done does not have teaching i have not filmed filmed somebody teaching but i'm going to get back to that but it's great for that kind of thing that you, when you see it from the outside, you probably know that if you ever have filmed your own <laughs> cheating, when you see it from the outside, it you sort of start to, uh, it elicits reflection on practice. You start, you start to see things that you didn't see before and uh, see possibilities and see weak points, strong points, see all these kind of things. So it's very good for that as well, instructional videos. So that was sort of why I chose this vehicle for for this for my purpose, making contribute con uh, contributing to sort of a shared language between educators within the field of music, and to make videos. That's also that's also a science. There's a lot of research as well. So when you make instructional videos, you have to. Well, well, at least if you want to do it like in the proper way, you have to come up with some design principles for these videos, things that you sort of take into mind in order to make the, the videos uh, the best possible. And I'm just going to sort of run through them kind of fast, um, short in scope, and uh, that you're able to um, sort of get to them 
at the time that you choose. So that's that's one of the things that I decided for this video. It's sort of the oh another way to say it. I could say like making them accessible on Facebook and YouTube makes them accessible asynchronously. So that was one of the things I knew they would not be on my private website where you sort of would have to pay or whatever. They had to be out in the public somehow. So short videos so you actually get people to see them and then make them accessible. That was number one. Number two, it has to speak the language and describe within the situations of those uh, persons who are intended to watch the video. So I'm not very academic and I speak very much about here and now in the pre in the cheating room, what can we do? That's number two. Number three, I'm also using a non-academic tone of communication. So I'm sort of speaking like I would speak uh, no, in normal day life to a colleague. So that's also, um, it's great. So to sort of be believable and trustable because I have the thing about cheating that's that's uh, very interesting is that you you actually have to make somebody into somebody else so that's why you need to uh, be believable somehow and the, you need to make them trust that it's actually worthwhile listening to what you have uh, on mind or on heart so and also I'm very much speaking into the, uh, sort of acknowledging that they already are skilled teachers. So I'm saying we teachers, I'm, I'm all the time speaking like it's a shared thing. And I'm speaking to colleagues, colleagues that already have a lot of knowledge. So that was also one of the aims. And you can say these four first principles, they are all sort of centered around the learning um uh, sort of area of the videos the next four ones that i'm putting up here it, it has more to do with what could be called multimedia pedagogic pedagogy and these principles are also all research research space based one of the things when you get into research on instructional videos is that you have to make them in a way where you don't have to think too much or you have to think about the right thing, the thing that you sort of have on mind. And um, there's a number, there's a great number of ways that you can sort of contribute to that. I chose four of them. And the first one here is that you have to somehow make make it possible for, uh, like say the video that I, that I did, the sort of the biggest video I did was 20 minutes. But it's not me speaking from the start to the end and la 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 because that everybody will get lost including myself if i had to listen to that so you have to sort of make it into segments somehow so it's possible to pause it's possible to um some or i also make an effort to sort of round up certain before i continue so you you have to make this segmentation very uh clear it could also include like when you post on YouTube that you make uh, in the comments, no, not the, in the info section for the videos, you sort of make, um, you, I'm sure you all have seen that, you make a hyperlink so you can get to a particular place in the video that, that deals with exactly this subject. So this kind of segmentation is very important in, to sort of make it more digestible. That's what it's all about. Then as a, another one, using words and pictures rather than just words, that makes you understand it in a different way. I'm not going to get into that because that's it's it's not complicated, but it's a big area. But the thing is that you sort of the way the brain works, that you process words in one way, pictures in another way. And it's a great combination when you sort of somehow get these two tied together that uh, enhances understanding. So that's a long story, but so I'm using words and pictures rather than just words for the videos. Uh, again, not to sort of make people overstrain their, their brain. I'm doing what what is referred to here as played out examples, because I even though I don't film, uh, actual teaching situations i speak like i was in the situation so i say okay so you, if you're in this room and this thing happens then 
and this blah 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 so so i'm sort of making a imaginary cheating situation and i sort of follow it to the end again not to just not to leave them hanging where they sort of have to guess why did he say that or what was actually emphasis here or what was it that he was pointing to at this point so you sort of uh you go for like introducing something speaking about it but also rounding it off so it doesn't leave a lot of questions hanging uh where you want to leave the questions hanging because that also has a a, a great effect it's like at the end for instance i say where you sort of try to make them work because we all know from experience at least i do watching a video it can be great you understand what's uh what's it's about it might think ah that's might even that might even be useful for you, for me but then I, immediately after i do something else uh and i've sort of forget about it and the day after i have almost forgot about it and the week after i completely forgot about it so what you want to do you want to find a way to make them involved in a way that sort of ties this information that i'm introducing to them into their world and that's the principle of learning you i'm sure you all know that that tying it to, to previous experience is fundamental as far as getting any kind of message across so what i'm doing at the end of the video for instance is that i'm saying okay friends monday you have this class how can you use this particular this knowledge that i have it into, introduced to you how can you use it in a very very concrete way in your world please think about that and i'm gonna get a little more back to that because that's one of the things that worked less well with this project but um you somehow have to make them uh, activate them somehow all right um here i just put them all eight of up in like one slide where the first four sort of has to do with finding an uh, engaging kind of approach and the latter four has to do with sort of making the videos effective so that's what uh, yeah that's sort of the design principles for my videos so now if somebody somewhere is wondering okay what did the look video looks like i have um a slide first <laughs> that before we get to the video but uh, what I did is I posted them on YouTube and I posted them on, on Facebook um, shortly put and uh, I made a, a dedicated YouTube channel and also a closed Facebook group and uh, I had some intention with this but I, that I'm going to get back to in a couple of slides but this video speaks about what's called the didact didactical relationship model and I'm sure most of you already know it, but I just put it here just to sort of refresh your mind. So that, so it sort of divides the teaching situation into six sort of distinct areas. It's made by uh, you know, uh, two Norwegian theorists that's called Heem and Hippe. And I'm sure our Norwegian guest uh, knows all about this. But this is basically what the video is about. And why did I choose this one? because it's very very basic and very very general and very very easy to understand and it is also very easily applicable for the, for the persons for uh, pretty much any teacher of music i would say so you you have these things you consider who are you teaching where what are the sort of the framework what why are you doing this why are you choosing these things that you have taught uh, sorry that you have uh, chosen to teach and what is it exactly and uh, and so on and so forth and then especially evaluation is also a great great way of looking at it but anyway i'm not going to get into detail about this if you are if it's vague in your mind you can watch the video <laughs> later all right so here i just took two minutes of the video just to sort of give an uh example of what it looks like so i'm uh, yeah, so we're just gonna see a minute or a minute and a half or something like that. Velkommen til den her video, som handler om den didaktiske relationsmodel og om hvordan du kan bruge den til at kaste et bredere blik 
på din egen undervisning. Da jeg selv startede med at undervise for mange år siden, havde jeg ikke nogen formel uddannelse i at undervise. Jeg gik til det med baseret på erfaring og prøvede mig frem, og var sikkert også i baghovedet inspireret af nogle af de gode undervisere, jeg har haft gennem tiden, og måske også nogle af de dårlige undervisere, jeg har haft gennem tiden. Og på baggrund af det, fik jeg det ligesom til at fungere, og jeg vil sige, at jeg underviste. Det gjorde jeg rigtig mange år. På et tidspunkt tog jeg så nogle akademiske uddannelser, hvor jeg lærte om mere formel pædagogik, eller almen pædagogik, som man kalder det. Og der er nogle af de ting, som jeg tænker vil være rigtig gode for dig, måske også. De har i hvert fald inspireret mig selv til at få et andet blik på min undervisning. Og en af de ting, som de kan hjælpe med, det er tit, vi musikere er jo sådan ret helhedsorienterede og holistiske typer, ofte, eller på mange måder i hvert fald. Og derfor har vi måske også en tendens til at ligesom opfatte undervisningssituationen som vævet sammen og lidt svær at decifrere eller lave kategorier af det det ene og det det andet. All right, I'm taking the liberty to sort of skip out because we we should not uh, spend too much time, but that's basically what it is. And it's also basically uh, sort of digital storytelling that I'm using myself as a and with my weaknesses to sort of promote a situation where it becomes um, sort of trustable what I'm about to say and it's not in a calculated bad way it's in a calculated good way that you sort of introduce yourself as not perfect here's some of the sli some slides from various places in the video and also on one of the slides you can see the segmentation that I was speaking about before on YouTube which is a uh, great in many ways uh, also for myself as a user on other videos that you don't have to watch the whole video to sort of find out where uh, where, where the information that you need is located um yeah so we have a couple minutes left right camilla yeah so the question is i was saying this is stainless and says venue which could be uh then what and the question is how as far as it being a research project what i did not succeed in uh oh sorry what i did not succeed in was i i kind of thought okay i'll put this i'll make these videos available on youtube and facebook and then we'll start to have a big big uh sort of um discussion about how could this be used could it, what works what doesn't how can it be used what's uh, what are your experiences as far as using this and can you help me sort of somehow improve on this and and first and foremost could it be sort of a community where it's not the question about me sort of providing the answers but we can all sort of contribute to a discussion about these things um making our teaching better so to say and i i i i didn't sort of find the key to that thing yet but i'm working on it and one of the things that some of you might be uh, um know about already is that there's this person called garrison that has made a thing called community of inquiry and there's certain ways you can structure these kind of situations where learning is sort of in between people it could be with the facilitator like me but it's it's a sort of a it it has to do with everybody involved and everybody is sort of responsible to somehow com contribute to the development of this shared knowledge so that that's the thing that i'm looking into currently how can i make it because i i've found out for sure that just posting it and putting it out there doesn't uh, doesn't uh, sort of bring home the cow so to say so you have to do other things to sort of make it you have to um somehow scaffold it in a way where it it gets more of a community issue but the, the, that i would be interested in your opinions on that as well let me see if i have uh now that's that's actually it 
Camilla. So uh, are we sort of within time? Yes, it's perfect, Torben. Thank you so much. So um, if maybe, can you stop your sheen ah, screen sharing? Not sheen squaring, that's something else. Um, does anyone have any questions for Torben? And remember, again, if you don't want to be appearing on the recording, then what, write it in the chat. Christian, yes? Yes, hi Torben, thank you, very interesting. Um, I'm curious how the use of these instructional videos changes the premise or um, the dynamic of the classroom. You know, I, some of the things you've shown here, I, I assume you would be doing that in class before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now people have checked this out in preparation, so you don't have to do it in class anymore. So what is it that that can now happen in the classroom uh, that that wasn't uh, that, that perhaps there wasn't time for before? Or could you elaborate a bit on that? Sure. And and uh, and correctly, yeah. But the the thing is, like say, um, if a subject like mine, like uh, theoretical pedagogy, has been very reduced on the conservatory. So what, like meaning like less and less hours. The thing is that it, these things takes time because you're, you're sort of trying to bring somebody from one field into a more practical field. And that it takes time. So it's not just like giving the information, then go play with it. It's like giving the information and then sort of somehow uh, reflect on what what is the information and and in which way could it be valuable for me and could it be valuable for me so this has to do christian with the like the flipped classroom kind of thing where you sort of introduce them to something in advance and then hopefully they will watch it i think chances are that they will watch this is probably bigger than if i give them a text like i, I would have done 10 years ago and they, they didn't read that either, a lot of, but anyway, so giving them things in advance. And then once we get into the class, everybody is uh, hopefully already acquainted with the subject and we can start a discussion. What use could this have for you? So that's, that, that's the whole thing, the flipped classroom thing. And it, it could, you could also extend it, like say, I, I give the I give this video as an introduction to, for instance, then the didactical rela relationship model. We have the discussion, and then I'll give them some assignment. It could even be to make a small video comment or video log on. Okay, now you have a tool, go use it, and then make a short video, five minutes, just you telling how did you do, how did it work out for you. And I'm, these are things that I'm moving into now, but it's it's definitely uh, worthwhile because it it's, it saves time and you get to the more interesting thing, which is finding out how can I use this to sort of make my my teaching better. Does that um, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. Any more questions for Torben? I can... Oh yeah, thank you, Ian. Sorry, I couldn't oh, no. see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, go. I don't know. Um, thanks, Tori. Great, great work you're doing. I, I love it when someone gets into the nerdy bits of doing what they're doing and telling all about it. That's good. Um, I'm interested in the student perspective. Any student feedback? Any any interactive like uh, evaluations? And and also, how does evaluation lead to? what you do with the video do you have you had to go back and cut the video up and do new sections because you've had feedback from the students um any sort of things like that how, how how's the ongoing work within yeah. in a qualitative perspective yeah. and that that's sort of where i am now what i already right uh, answer it in two ways what i already have done is i i have uh, worked with two groups of teachers in the, my local music school here in the area where I'm, where I'm located. And I, I gave them the, the video in advance. I went to, and I, and I gave them a short instruction, like, I would like you to see this, this video. I would like you to um, uh, sort of apply it to a lesson, the, your next lesson with these, 
with some kind of class and I will be there to observe the class and then I make a I made an interview with them after to mm. sort of find out as a is it only me who thinks this is a a great thing or do they is it actually usable for them and the yes. result for that even though sort of uh, it's a limited limited research that they it was definitely possible for them and it it sort of facilitated a discussion that they would not have had otherwise because the, the the great thing you can say about particularly the didactical relationship model is that it's so clear and organized so all of a sudden we could have a discussion about what went on in the teaching mm. that was more clear and organized and they had that feeling as well to answer your other question as far as do i go back and sort of redo the things um I'm in the process of that, and I made before I made the the sort of the long uh, video about the, the textical relationship model. I had made a number of sort of uh, alpha prototypes where I had tried different things and had some comments. Mm. And um, and where I'm at now, I, I completely understand your your question. Where I'm at now is like now I sort of have a a foot on what research says about this thing. Hmm. And now I'm, I'm going to start to to do more sort of like a practical research with ap applying it to students and other teachers and see what their reaction is. But It'll I think it was, it was necessary for me personally to sort of get a better grasp of what works like in multimedia ped pedagogy, for hmm. instance, because I didn't, I had seen a lot of you, YouTube videos, like I'm sure everybody has, but I had no sort of formal knowledge on how to how to construct them. Hmm. So, but it's an ongo Ian, it's an ongoing thing. Yeah, so and we do love it now. Follow you uh, as that goes on. So you'll have to reconnect with us again, so that as it goes. But are you familiar of a of a thing that we have in Sweden? I think it's in some of the other countries as well. Um, uh, uh, in the music schools, uh, a lot of the people are using the the um, play along platform, um, which was developed in Sweden. It's a series of of uh, lessons that of shorter lessons, ten minute ten minute videos, that um, you can give your students to do between lessons or things like that. Some of the culture school or the music schools here in Sweden are doing it um, in a way that's very interactive. So for instance, guitar teachers are doing every third lesson physical and the two lessons in between are the interactive ones. And then they have tutoring in between that's online. Yeah. And, and that's that, that means that they can take principally three times the amount of students now because they're, they're, they're teaching every week, but they're teaching group A, B, and C. And then in between, they're doing the play along. And, and it's actually been quite a success mm. um, with, with, with the students. So, so there's, there is some, some ongoing research with that now. So it would be good to. Absolutely. Yeah, we have similar things in Denmark. And I think, COVID sort of jump started a lot of things in yeah. relation to that. So, but um... well, play along has about fifteen years of experience and a, and a whole bunch. I think they have thousands of videos. <laughs> they're, they're quite established. Um, um, that's um, a, the Swedish the Swedish way. You're already a little ahead of us. Oh yeah, but we probably did it wrong. So it, it could be a way to to get you all together. It's like we just yeah. go ahead and do it. And... <laughs> but, it but it's very interesting and and uh as far as myself personally i i think my aim is is sort of trying to get the teachers more, more knowledgeable yeah and and but 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 uh, i'm sure some of the same things could could sort of be uh, applied across the sections that some of the things that works well in the system that you're referring to could also uh, could be inspiring for doing these kind of things mm. absolutely uh, oh, yeah. michael I think Marcus was first, though. Um, oh, okay, sorry. And yeah, even no. though we're running a bit out of time, I yeah, think if exactly. you're okay with being on a little bit longer, yes. then let's have the two last questions, and then I'll quickly round off. Okay. And yeah, great. So, Marcus, go. Yeah, thank you. This is really interesting, and I'm I'm really happy that that these kind of activities occur, and uh, kind of continuation to to what Ian led us. So, I think the. What we do in in different countries, they are really different. The settings and uh, and uh, the structures. So I somehow missed 
kind of what was what was your uh, main target group? Because I, I see that this has a, a lot of potential, not only for students who are currently studying, but as well for professional development for our teachers who are already working. So, so I, I somehow missed that point. The, 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 um... Marcus, that's that's a good point, and I didn't sort of I was not clear about it. The, my project was initially sort of uh, directed towards music teachers educated in the conservatory that has left the conservatory and now are in a music school and somehow feeling lonely there. But that being said, it's also for sure I think uh, some of my colleagues would could benefit greatly from watching the same video. Because it is sort of a knowledge that are not so present in the in the conservatory, uh, and which could I think everybody could benefit from. So it could be for those who have left the conservatory. It could be for those teachers teaching presently in the conservatory, and it can also be for music teachers in general. If that is, if the videos are made in a way where they are believable and trustable, and sort of. Uh, not too academic and sort of can speak into a very practical angle on it. Does that mm -hmm. make it clear, Marcus? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I can be very quick then because that was my comment. That's what I especially appreciate about the presentation. It's so applicable to, to, to different pedagogical contexts and also that somehow you're bridging the between the people who do the hands-on teaching and the people who have a lot of pedagogical theory, but sometimes are a little remote from reality. So I, it really, it's covering the middle ground and I think it's a very valuable um, project. So yeah, thanks a lot for that. I just wanted the, the one reference you had to about the re relational model. I just wanted to say the original model is by uh, two other Norwegians called Bjorn Dahl and Lieberg. So if you, if you ever write about then that just that you have the, yeah, you probably you know that for, anyway. Thank you for pointing it out, and, yeah. and I, I, I I am aware of that because uh, yeah. because it, as as always, these things sort of develops. And yeah, I know this is everywhere. This model, yeah, but it's yeah. very valuable. Yeah. It's very valuable, and congr yeah. congratulations yeah. on Norwegian pedagogy, who is way well, ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, they are based it on a German model, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> that's that's how it goes. So it's like yeah. in music. It, it evolves so exactly so thanks again thank you amazing thank you very much torben for a lovely presentation